thanks for coming. What a great event. It's a, amazing to see this much energy um, and so many people getting together to talk about these topics. Um, I'm excited this morning to talk to you about the psychology of the consumer. I want to thank the IFPA for having us. We've had a great partnership um, of research and insights over the years, working first with the PMA and now the IFPA to get deeper into consumer psychology and motivations for choices around produce and floral. Um, what you're going to see today is not your uh, typical consumer psychology discussion. One of the things that we've revealed in behavioral science over the last 40 years is that humans are systematically irrational, driven by the non-conscious, and their behaviors are weighted by emotion. And so today we're going to take you through a journey of the new way of understanding consumer psychology, the motivations behind choice, and how you can apply it uh, to your own businesses. So the first thing to understand when we're trying to understand consumer motivations is we need to get to where consumers are. To have empathy and be able to market effectively, we need to understand how people are actually feeling. And the state of the world is a major factor influencing uh, human consumer choices today. Inflation is at an all-time high, and consumer confidence is at an all-time low. In the UK, uh, inflation accelerated to a 40-year high, um, and um, consumer confidence fell at the same time. It's not just in the UK, obviously this is a global situation, and in the US, inflation is pushing half of Americans to consider second jobs, um, and we see, again, it's not abating uh, anytime soon. So what does this mean for understanding the consumer, and how do we market to the consumer? How do we understand what the consumer really wants? We need to understand the emotions that the consumer is feeling. What are the pressures, what are the pain points, and what are the points of pleasure that we can deliver to consumers? So in that world, if you're marketing produce and you're marketing in general, marketing produce, marketing floral, whatever you're marketing, this is an issue that we've always faced. Up to 60% of our marketing advertising spend is wasted. You know the old adage, right? Uh, I know half of my marketing works, I just don't know which half. Well, <laughs> that's a problem, right? Um, multiple sources cite the trillion dollars in global spending on advertising um, is largely wasted. Nearly half or more of that advertising spend, that marketing effort, is not effective. Furthermore, brands then are left with new product launches, bringing new product to market that is uh, woefully, um, woefully, from a business perspective, uh, insufficient. 95% of new product launches fail. That's from the Harvard Business Review. What <laughs> a success rate is 5%. That is hard to do, right? What does that tell us? It tells us we're not really understanding what the consumer wants. If 95% of our products launches fail, are we really putting product out into the market that consumers want? I think the answer is no. Why is that the case? Is because most of these marketing and innovation decisions are based on consumer surveys. This is a technique that was developed back in the 30s and 40s to understand political polling. We just decided we were going to apply it to everything, understand human motivation just by asking people questions. This is a great study by Gerald Zaltman, um, and in his book, How Customers Think, he revealed that only 18% of consumers who say they're going to buy a product actually follow through on that purchase decision. You've probably done that kind of work, right? How likely are you to buy this if I put this new package on the product, if I launch this new uh, offering into the market? Extremely likely, very likely, you know those scales, those survey scales? they're woefully inaccurate at predicting actual behavior. So if that's what we're basing our understanding of consumers on, um, instruments and a method that only understands less than 20% of actual behavior, of course our marketing is going to be wasted and our new product launches are not going to be effective. So understanding the consumer, coming to where they are right now is even more important. In times that we're facing right now, we can't afford to waste a single dollar in marketing or innovation spend. And so we can't rely solely on traditional methods like surveys of understanding how consumers think. 
as I mentioned, the last 40, 50 years of behavioral science has revealed that we are irrational in systematic ways and emotion influences our decisions. So what has business done to take that fundamental knowledge from academia and put it to practice? Well, it's a new world. It's a new world in understanding human emotion. And we're gonna show you a couple of technologies today. We're gonna to show you some examples and how they relate to understanding consumer emotion and drive actual behavior to drive profits. Um, as you look at us, um, Sentient, we believe that if you understand how people truly feel, what their true emotions are, and you know why they feel that way, those two things, empathy happens. You don't have to think about it. If you understand how someone truly feels and you really know why they feel that way, you feel empathy. It's a human experience. And when we have empathy for humans, for consumers, we can deliver meaningful value. So this is really about empathy. It's about understanding where humans and consumers are, what they want, what their emotions are, and how we can deliver against those emotions and motivational needs. So we're going to show you a couple of technologies um, that are advanced behavioral science applied to business. Um, these technologies measure human emotion, they measure attention, and they measure change in the non-conscious mind. That may sound magical. It's not. It's actually just science. From the behavioral science literature, methods have been developed to understand how people truly feel and why without relying on what people are willing and able to admit. Uh, report in a survey. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the technologies that is new to uh, business and to marketing is called facial action coding. I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is a technology that actually maps um, your face, 72 different points on your face. You know, when you get a new phone and you're doing your, your face uh, mapping. Similar technology, but instead of recognizing your face, what that technology does is it measures system movement of the muscles in your face. You have 43 muscles in your face that are deliberately expressing, they're used for deliberate expression of emotion and social intention. Um, this technology allows us to measure moment by moment the movement of those muscles in your face and understand the emotions that you're expressing when you're exposed to marketing, um, new product innovation, packaging. There aren't any questions being asked here. We're simply presenting marketing material, product innovation, packaging to consumers, and we're observing the emotions that are expressed. And those are overall positive negative emotions, as you can see. They're also discrete emotions like disgust and uh, anger. <laughs> disgust has a very distinct uh, expression. You, know, you draw your lips back, you're, you can do a disgust look on your own face and you can actually start to feel that. Do a little disgust look on your face, right? We do that in a system. Okay. Imagine if that was the expression that your consumer <laughs> was exhibiting when they were watching your ad or looking at your new packaging or looking at the product that you're about to bring to market. You would want to know that, right? They might be too polite to tell you in a survey, but if it's written all over their face, you've got a different level of insight. The second technology is a technology that measures the non-conscious mind. This was pulled from the behavioral science literature uh, studying stereotypes and biases. If you're interested in understanding whether somebody is biased towards another group of people, you can't rely on a survey, right? You can't, um, if you're interested in understanding stereotypes, you can't rely solely on what people will tell you because either they won't tell you or they don't have conscious access to the fact that they do have biases towards groups of people. The industry took that method and said, hey, this can be applied to any topic where someone may not be able to really express to you what motivates their behavior. So if I um, do that animation for you again, you'll see this is a technology that uses consumer response on smartphones or on desktops and laptops, and it measures 
times down to the millisecond after exposure to some important stimulus. That millisecond timing of response is indicative of the approach and avoidance emotion that a consumer feels towards your product or your brand. And you'll see it here um, as it comes up here on this um, illustration. Imagine being presented with these different brands. We're gonna show you some actual data on this in a second. And we're just gonna prime you for just half a second. Have one of these brands zoom at you. That automatically activates your feelings towards that brand in your non-conscious mind. Your response times of sorting emotions following exposure to a brand or a product or a package tell us what your automatic reaction is. That's the non-conscious. And when you combine that non-conscious emotional response approach and avoidance emotion through natural gesturing with the conscious mind, you much more accurately predict consumer behavior. What do you feel when you see wonderful pistachios? <laughs> what do you feel when you see Nichols Farms? What do you feel when you see bulk pistachios come up? Very different automatic emotional associations. You can feel the power of the brand. The product's exactly the same there, right? But the power of the brand comes through and it influences what we think and ultimately our behaviors. So when you do this kind of study, you would be like, does that really work? Do we really actually capture immediate emotional response when we're doing these kinds of measures? Well, if you look at a scale like this, we just do this with some positive, pleasant, and uh, aversive stimuli just to show you that it works. The, the neutral line there is zero, so neither positive nor negative. Above 100, as you're going to see, is positive, and below 100 is negative. So what's the most appealing automatically? The baby faces, right? Everybody loves a baby's face. Um, you're prime with a baby's face, automatic positive reaction, very quick swipe towards yourself. And then in this study, then there was the image of the woman. Uh, then the man it came down quite a bit, but still quite positive, right? <laughs> but you can see that it's working. Uh, the spider um, is a little bit negative, uh, but he's kind of a cute spider with those big eyes. The cop car in the rear view mirror. How about that one? That's like an automatic negative reaction, right? I show you that and it's like, ah, oh, fear. What I love about that one, besides snakes and babies and the shape of the human body, is the cop car in the rear view mirror is an association that's formed through experience. You're not born with an innate fear of cop cars in your rear view mirror, right? But the first time it happened to you, you felt extreme emotion. And emotion is actually the mechanism for cementing memories in your mind. The more emotion you feel in a moment, the more memorable that moment is. And so when you're, and think about that from a marketing and branding perspective, that association was not formed before you had the experience. The same thing happens with every touch point of your consumer with your brand, your product, your advertising. The more emotional that experience, the stronger the memory trace, the longer it lingers in the mind. The more you're associated with whatever those emotions were when you were experiencing that. Finally, the snake, right? That snake in 83. So this gives you a sense of the, just the, the scale of this. Now, does it apply to other things? This gives you a degree of emotion that you can't get from traditional research and survey methods. Here is the generational differences from a study we did on reactions to COVID-19. So 92, not as much for Gen Z, but all negative, right? And then boomers and Gen X really didn't like it, about down to the level of the snake. You know, nobody liked COVID-19, right? That was all negative. But now imagine that, since you now have a sense of the scale of this kind of measurement, what does it mean for brands? What are the automatic associations with a brand? Um, Apple, a beloved brand, 115 score. Dove, also a really well-known and beloved brand. Avocados from Mexico, are you here? Good news, it's positive. <laughs> Not quite at the Apple level, but imagine if you got up there, right? That's incredible. Wonderful pistachios, just about 100, so kind of a neutral. Um, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into wonderful pistachios as well. And then get into the banking brands, so you can see, now we've got a scale, a human scale that shows us the degree of automatic emotional reaction to brands, products, packaging, new innovation. And we can scale it according to a fundamental human reaction to stimuli. So what does this do? Does it, does it actually mean um, anything for, for us from a marketing and profit perspective? 
Well, I want to give you some data here. This is from a study out of our lab, three-year study, um, 200 different ads were tested in this, 14,000 consumers. And what we were predicting was the number of online views of the advertisements, essentially shares, online voice, number of views, the virality of an ad. In this study, the surveys only predicted 14% of the actual behavioral response to those ads. You know, we talked about 18% before, here's another replication of it. 14% of the behavior to an ad is explained by surveys. That's not okay, right? We can't, we cannot um, base our decisions on data that is that inaccurate. When you add the facial action coding, the expression of the emotion on the face, we explained 47% of all of the behavior around an ad. And when you add in the change in the non-conscious mind, that automatic gut level reaction, now we're explaining 65% of all the behavior related to online advertising. The world of understanding the consumer has changed. We don't have to rely solely on what people will tell us on a scale in a survey. If we can measure their actual emotion and we can measure what's happening in their non-conscious mind prior to experiencing that emotion, we're four to five times as accurate in predicting behavior in the market. So this is powerful. This is a power, these are powerful tools to allow you to be more successful, uh, build brand, and um, be able to charge price premiums um, for your product. So a couple of examples that we're gonna go through here um, using this technology um, include um, understanding the top drivers of produce choices. Now price and quality, those are typically always top in the top for, for driving consumer behavior, but there are other factors that influence um, consumer decision making, and we'll, we'll show you some of those. Um, we wanted to understand you know, whether consumers are more rational about a produce and floral choices today. Are they more emotional? Are they more irrational? I think that's a false dichotomy. Um, why is one brand chosen over another? We'll show you some examples of that. And is produce branding, how is it similar and how is it different um, from other food products and fast moving consumer goods? Okay, I want to show you um, a couple of examples of studies that have been done in, in the space. Um, when we look at price and quality, they're typically always top drivers. But in addition to those factors, those sort of stable takes, it's table stakes, it's got to be within my price range, it's got to have the quality that I expect. A, many studies have shown that the emotional states of consumers, when they're making choices, drive their decisions. Um, those, deci those emotional states could be a state of happiness, they could be a state of sadness. They, right now, they're largely a state of anxiety. With inflation and the challenges that we're facing, in the, in the world today, consumers are feeling tremendous anxiety. Understanding that emotional state of consumers will influence how you market, how you message to them. And those emotional associations will ultimately drive their choice. You've all heard about emotional eating, right? Um, but uh, it goes deeper than just, oh gosh, I'm stressed and I'm gonna eat more. It, it influences the types of choices that we make. Um, I'll show, I'm gonna tell you a story about Cheetos and carrots and how they are uh, similar in terms of consumer motivations. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Um, the second study here on consumer emotions um, has shown that when you classically condition people and pair produce um, foods cho choices with positive imagery and positive words, and classical conditioning is pairing systematically over time, positive words, positive images, here's produce, um, that classical conditioning or pairing of produce with those positive associations creates a behavioral response among people to choose the healthier options. They're not choosing them because they're healthier, they're choosing them because they have now automatic positive associations paired with them. And again, think about that from a branding perspective. That's essentially how branding works. When you're branding, when you're advertising, you're pairing your brand, your product, your new innovation with imagery, um, concepts that you want the brand to stand for. If those are motivational and they touch on consumer values, they get a attached to your brand through conditioning and that, that association carries through and influences consumer choice. 
Um, the past research that we've done um, with um, the Produce Marketing Association and now the IFPA um, revealed some very interesting results. A lot of messaging in the space is based on health benefits, right? And that's important. That's our goal. Um, we're trying to make changes in human health as we, as we saw this morning. There are many ways to get there. Health messaging isn't the only way to motivate consumers. And our past research, which you'll be able to download a report on, actually shows that these rational appeals of health messaging actually are not as motivational. So yes, health matters, but at any given time when a consumer is making a choice on foods, they're expecting an experience uh, from that food. And that experience tends to be emotional. And that means it's driven by the subconscious, uh, the automatic associations we have, and those automatic associations can override the rational mind to drive choice. So I want to tell you a story about Cheetos and, and carrots. <laughs> Um, I'll go back on, on this one. Um, in the original study um, that we did with the Protus Marketing one of the fascinating findings um, that we saw was that the motivation for um, buying carrots, for eating carrots, was not about health. It wasn't about vitamins. It wasn't about you doing something good for your body. The driver, the number one driver of that choice was actually the mouthfeel of the carrot. It was the crunch. Consumers were looking for that emotional experience as they ate the carrot. There's satisfaction in that. You, I, we've all done that, right? You bite into a carrot and mm, that feels good. There's something about the mouthfeel that produces an emotional response in consumers. And it wasn't about health. It was like, I want that crunch. If you had that insight, how would that change your messaging? if the number one driver was about the mouthfeel, the experience of the carrot and not the health benefits, and that was gonna drive choice. You'd lean into that message in a different way. You'd try to touch those consumer emotions and evoke them before, as consumers are trying to make the choice. How does that relate to Cheetos? <laughs> when, I, uh, uh, when I read uh, those results coming out of that study, and you can download that report on, on the next, uh, next screen, um, I said that is very similar to some results that we found in 2008 during the economic depression 2008 uh, Frito-Lay consumer packaged good um, company you know them well they do Cheetos they do Ruffles they do Lay's you know all of those uh, packaged goods during that time Frito-Lay saw a rise in the um, in the purchase tendency towards chips that had a hard mouthfeel including kettle based chips Cheetos those kinds of uh, those kinds of products, as opposed to just buying a thin potato chip, people were now buying these kettle cooked potato chips. And it was the research at that time showed that it was related to stress reduction. Eating those kettle chips, it was the mouthfeel. Those Cheetos, it was the mouthfeel, uh, along with all that salt that's delivered, right? <laughs> that was um, motivating that rise, that shift in choice among consumers. Uh, the motivation there was stress reduction. They're trying to reduce stress, trying to relieve anxiety. That was the motivation there, similar to a carrot. <laughs> All right, now going into why, we'll show you some example on this next. Why is one brand chosen over another and is branding of produce as effective as it is for other foods? First of all, yes, branding matters, absolutely. Um, and it's typically emotional associations with the brand that are a driver. And if you're not a well-known brand, the automatic associations with your packaging is especially important. If you don't have a brand that's well-known with associations already formed in the minds of consumers, that immediately experience with your packaging is telling the consumer something about what your brand is, what it stands for, how it differentiates from a, um, uh, a non-branded item or a bulk item. Um, messaging that taps into consumer values of the moment. And as we said, it's anxiety right now. How do we actually tap into that consumer experience? And effective branding provides ultimately price premium power for the produce itself. Well-branded produce will gain an additional premium over the same product, not branded.
Um, here's just an example on why anxiety is so important for us to understand. Um, people's associations with 2022 um, and those expressing anxiety, it's all about the economy. Now that doesn't mean you have to message on price. That's not the solution. The solution is understanding how our product can actually alleviate the anxiety that people are feeling, not about price necessarily. So if you want to dig into that data and um, go a little bit deeper, this full report um, that we did with the IFPA is at bit.ly forward slash emotion food. And you can get the report there, you can go deeper into, you can see the carrot results, you can go deeper into those consumer motivations. This is a great resource for you. We are now replicating this study with the IFPA this year. And you have an opportunity to contribute to that work. Um, I'll give you an opportunity to sign up and provide insight on the types of questions that you would like to have answered around consumer motivations um, and behaviors. Um, this is, um, a lot has changed uh, for the consumer in the last few years. And this re refresh of this work is going to be able to tell you what the motivations are today to help you market effectively. So I want to finish with an example um, of uh, some great branding. Um, this is uh, from Wonderful Pistachios, and we're using a product here called Rapid Subtext. It's a motion AI, and it's going to measure the non-conscious associations with Wonderful Pistachios before we expose people to an ad, and then we're going to measure how they feel about Wonderful Pistachios after they see the ad. And while they're watching the ad, we're going to measure the muscle movement in their face so we know their emotional journey, okay? And let's watch the ad first. And as I play this, you're gonna see a line come across the screen. That is the emotion being expressed by consumers while they watch this ad. Above zero is positive on this scale. Are you ready? Have you seen this one? Golden, we hear a wonderful pistachios. Take your concerns about our no-shells ads very seriously. Uh-huh, then what's that? Go, 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 is that how people eat those? I'm going in. Almost everyone loves no shells. <laughs> I love that. Let's watch it again. Now, not everybody's got the budget as a wonderful pistachios, but um, the principles here are the same. We're evoking consumer emotion. What emotion is being evoked here? It's not about, hey, these are healthier than chips, right? Although those are good too. Those ads are good too. This isn't about health. Golden, we hear wonderful pistachios. Take your concerns about our no-shells ads very seriously. Uh-huh. So what's that? Go, 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 Is that how people eat those? You too. Get in here. I'm going in. I love it. You know, the turtle's like, is that how people eat those? That's the joke line, right? That's about excitement. That's about, that's a party. That's a party on pistachios. Here's what it did for the brand. You saw that 99.7 before. After a single viewing of We Take Your Concerns Seriously, that's the name of that ad, emotional appeal for wonderful pistachios had a significant lift, significant positive automatic association with wonderful pistachios after a single viewing. And importantly, we measured the association with bulk pistachios before and after seeing that ad too. And so while you see the category gets a little bit of a lift, it really doesn't lift as much as wonderful pistachios. This is evidence of distinct differentiation for the brand. And we'll go one step further on this. I just wanna show you this line. You see that green line? That line represents the people who end up non-consciously more favorable towards wonderful pistachios. That tells you at that point that that is what's delivering the appeal for your brand. Counterintuitive for most produce marketing, right? That's not a health message. That's an excitement message and it's a relief of stress and anxiety message. It's hitting the consumer where they are right now in a state of anxiety and we're throwing a party over pistachios. Good for the brand and good for the business. Great scores, uh, upper right-hand quartile in terms of percentages. 
So there's that QR code again. If you want to participate in the next um, stage of research and understanding consumer motivations and emotions, um, just scan there and you can um, drop your questions that you would like to have answered uh, or addressed um, in that work um, into, that, uh, into that intake form. So generally just takeaways, you know, studies have shown that emotional states, happiness and sadness affect food choices. Wonderful pistachios is a great example of that. We're in a state of anxiety. Let's get people excited about something. Unlock the emotional associations that they hold with foods and you can influence their behaviors and empathize with the consumer. Where are they now? It's not just about price. How does our offering offer them emotional benefits in the state that they're in today? Okay, um, as I said, you can get involved. 2023 research, uncover new drivers of choice, help influence the research objectives, um, scan that QR code, or go to visit bit.ly, IFPA, um, uh, dash SDS. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.